Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Asad Lalji, and for those who are joining us for the first time, a very special welcome. Please refer to the chat box for more information on Avid Learning and our platform and our partners for this evening. Avid Online was launched on the 1st of April 2020 in the direct response to the pandemic. So now we're 19 months young and over 280 programs later, we can say although this period has challenged us in unprecedented ways, we continue to champion and bring to our audiences the best of the arts and culture, staying true to our mantra as always that learning never stops. Live History India and Avid Learning present Cultural Capitals, Future Legacies of India's Cities. This series aims to spotlight India's cities, their legacy and contributions that have shaped the nation's heritage and continues to have tremendous contemporary influence and impact. Cities under the cultural microscope have included Hyderabad, Ahmedabad, Jaipur, Chandigarh and Lucknow. The highlight is on the particularities of each city's unique culture and heritage and how these aspects have changed and evolved over time, influencing their perception in the wider world. Varied perspectives on the cultural identities of these urban scapes were presented as informed by history, hidden stories and local insights. And this brings me to our evening session and thank you for joining us once again on the next stop or the sixth edition of this exciting cultural journey through India's cities, Kohima. Kohima today is known as a land of festivals, having burgeoning cultural experiences that attract people from around the world. The capital state of Nagaland is now the center stage of contemporary art, international music, as well as one of the most promising cities in the list of upcoming smart cities in India. Allow me to introduce this evening's speakers and give them a warm virtual welcome. Singer, songwriter and music producer Imsha Imchen, Advisory Task Force for Music and Arts, Government of Nagaland and Governor's award-winning musician Teja Meru, award-winning dancer and choreographer Lam Yes <coughs> To Thang, who will be in conversation with co-founder and head of research at Live History India, Akshay Chavhan. For more about each of our speakers, please refer to their very impressive bios that have been pasted in the chat section. Today, these speakers and experts will look at Kohima through varied lenses, the city's growing art scene, its world-renowned architectural heritage, and its emergence as a regional cultural hub. Our panel will examine Kohima from the past, present and future perspectives and chart its journey and evolution through the years, which have shaped its distinct cultural fabric. Please note the session would last 75 minutes, followed by a 15 minute Q&A, in which Akshay will be taking questions submitted from the audience. So please keep them posted, continue posting them in the Q&A box throughout. On that note, thank you once again for tuning in. Over to you, Akshay, to level set and look forward to a fascinating session. Thank you. Thank you, Asad, for that wonderful introduction. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this very interesting talk on India's cultural capitals. When we speak of India's cultural cities, we speak of cities like Mumbai, Delhi, Lucknow and Hyderabad. Sadly, for most Indians, the northeastern region of India is a bit of a blind spot. Uh, but some amazing cultural renaissance is happening there. Today, we take you on a journey to Kohima, the capital of Nagaland. Now, thanks to the Hornbill Festival, Nagaland has, and Kohima has become a must visit for an avid traveler. But there is so much more that the city has to offer. So I'm going to ask each of my three distinguished panelists, what does Kohima mean to them? So Teja, I would uh, like to know, I mean, what are your perspectives on Kohima as a city? As uh, you know, this evening is a journey of discovery for all of us. Well, thank you, Akshay. And uh, I must thank Avid Learning for this wonderful opportunity to showcase Nagaland through some amazing talents like Imcha Lam Grace, whom I closely associate and work with. Uh, also, I thank Asad, a good friend, for some time now after our trip to Israel. We have been in constant touch. And I must thank you, Asad, 
for allowing us to share a little bit about our our, our town, our city. Uh, we'll do our, our best in the, in the short time given to us. Uh, I was born, raised in, in Kohima. Of course, for some few years, I studied out. But for most part of my childhood and my professional career and life uh, is based out of Kohima. And uh, no, Kohima has a lot of historical significance in that. Uh, if you look back to the, to the, to the 1944, uh, when the, the Allied forces stopped the Japanese from progressing further into the uh, Indian, uh, Indian, uh, India, our country. So this battle in Kohima remains as one of the most historic and one of, one of the most significant events in the life and history of Kohima city or Kohima town. And if you come to Kohima, there's a, a beautiful uh, common war a memorial grave maintained by the Commonwealth, and uh, it's a must visit. And a lot of people who visit Kohima, that is like one of the places first thing that they they move to. Uh, personally, as someone in the arts and music, over the last two decades, I must say I've seen a tremendous growth, especially in the area of music, dance, especially the, the, the contemporary. Of course, the traditional is the traditional part is something that we all have as a town, as a city, just so much part of our blood, our DNA, that will never change. It remains with us. Uh, but to do with the contemporary culture, like people like Imcha, Lam Grace, and the thousands uh, that uh, look like them and you know, feel like them and, 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 uh, and pursue the, their, their careers in the creative fields, uh, thousands of them uh, like them in Kohima. Uh, I've seen a tremendous growth and I think this speaks uh, a lot about our city and uh, how we also are influenced by social media, by television, and basically the pop culture that's like so, uh, so, so big and universal now across the world, uh, especially with, with social media and the media, uh, sort of a common culture that, that, that we see also in, in Kohima. So in brief, uh, uh, and I love this city. I've grown up here. And it's just so nice to see uh, as someone from this field that yes, we have our culture, but also we are also getting uh, an experience of the contemporary culture that's happening all over the world, happened right here at our, in our, in our sort of in our town. Uh, so that really excites me and uh, I'm proud to be a citizen of Kohima. And uh, yes, in brief, that's what I feel about uh, my, my place here and uh, what is happening here. So uh, before I come to Imcha, Teja, I want to ask you how how is it how was it growing up, growing up in Kohima? I mean, is it is it a very close knit city? Uh, is it uh, how how is it? Well, Kohima is uh, a, a, a city on a hill. That's what we say. It's not big. It's quite a, quite a sort of a, people here almost like know each other. Uh, I think it's very. Uh, it's close knit. People, like I said, they know each other very well. Uh, and and uh, yeah, now off lately in the last decade, maybe things uh, the the population have really drastically increased. So I think uh, more or less the 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 distance among people also are there. But more or less, it's still a, a very small town, uh, a city on a hill, and we we beautiful weather, surrounded by mountains. And I think that is uh, the unique part about uh, this, our Kohima. Wonderful, wonderful. So Imcha, I want to ask you, you know, as, as a, a young musician, what does uh, Kohima mean to you as a city? Well, uh, before we, uh, you should know that uh, I spent most of my childhood in uh, Bangalore. So basically it's my, like I just completed one year in Kohima. So I mean, like with what I've learned so far, you know, it's, it's a trendsetter. It's a trendsetter out here, you know, like how evolving, you know, with everything that we're doing here. And then, you know, it's which what I mean, like it's something. And then at the end of the day, I really love cold weather. So and then the weather, weather around out here in Kohima, I really enjoy it. So it means it's really close to my heart, you know. So I mean, like anybody who comes in Kohima, they will just be like in love with it and everything. So, yeah, that's what I'm vibing with it right now. <laughs> 
let me say bangalore to kohima is wow so i mean <laughs> how how was it moving from the bangalore and its infamous traffic to a place like kohima I mean, like there's. I mean, Bangalore has its advantages and disadvantages. You know, the things that I get in cities, I don't get here. You know, and then, and then the out here is like ah, the one thing I hate. I mean, like one of them, like it's the time. I mean, like <laughs> everything just closes off very early, you know. So, but at the end of the day, also that's a nice way to play with the youngsters. So yeah, ah, uh, I'm just loving it right out here right now. Fabulous, fabulous. So, Lam, what are your perspectives uh, on Kohima as a city? Okay, um, I was born and brought up uh, from Kohima itself, <laughs> so uh, I, I just love Kohima because whenever I go out, you know, to other cities, and uh, is like in just two three days, I miss my uh, hometown Kohima. Uh, the weather, especially. And the people are uh, the people here. They are, you know, like very friendly. So you know, we feel like uh, like a family only. It's not like, um, um, yeah, it's it's a family family feeling, you know, in in Kohima. And it's a very quiet uh, place. Not very quiet, but it's it's a very place, uh, peaceful place. You can find a lot of uh, place where you can, you know, in all those uh, busy. Busy works, and with the stress, you go. You know, you find a, you can just find a place where you can relax, uh, chill out. And uh, over the years, that uh, over the years, what I've seen was, you know, there has been a lot of development. Uh, and I, I'm I I'm a street lover. You know, I love uh, to see things happening on the street. So uh, I grew up wishing something happens on the street. You know, so I did see it happening. Uh, over the years, so I'm really excited. And uh, Kohima is a place where you know uh, people from other districts, from Nagaland, they come to uh, they come here for educational purposes. Uh, they come here to get education, and uh, of course, it's it's a tourist spot. You know, uh, people. I, I'm a content creator too. You know, so whenever I upload things about Kohima, the people from you know other other states love it. They, they, it's a tourist, uh, tourist spot. You know, it's it's amazing. It's lovely. It's clean. Yeah, I I miss Kohima every time I go out. <laughs> and is it friendly? Fun. Friendly. Yeah, yeah, very friendly. <laughs> oh, wonderful! Even if so you I'm... go to. Uh, Sorry. So I'm going to come to Teja. I wanted to ask you, Teja, that. Uh, in the in the last decade, thanks to the Hornbill Festival, now suddenly visiting Nagaland, traveling to Kohima has become so popular among uh, Indian travelers, even foreign travelers. So, why in Hornbill Festival is so well known? Beyond it, I mean, how is the cultural scene of uh, Kohima? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yes, definitely, the Hornbill uh, is. Uh, I think this year we're going to celebrate the 22nd edition of the Hornbill Festival. So definitely it's, it's, it's very big. Uh, one reason why Hornbill Festival has become so popular is also because it really showcases the cultures of the 16 major tribes of Nagaland. Uh, one thing unique about Nagaland is uh, you know, our tribal way of life, our language, our food habits, uh, our dances, uh, our tribal attires are all, you know, so uniquely different, all the 16 tribes. So people really come to experience these colors, the, the food, the dances. And that is, that, that, that is what makes Hornbill uh, very, very unique. In fact, in, in 2019, I think we had uh, more than 230,000 2, in attendance over the, over the 10 days. And uh, I, I, I know you didn't ask about the music festival, but let me just... Uh, while we are still on the on the hornbill, uh, the music festival also has become very very popular uh, over the over the past years. Uh, we have had performers from uh, Korea, uh, from Hungary, Indonesia, and you know the list goes on. Uh, so this is becoming quite an attraction for for many, and uh, we are glad the way it is growing. And it, uh, it not only brings people, but it also offers a one window 
where people can truly discover uh, all the tribes of Nagaland may, without maybe uh, take, uh, going into all the, all the districts, which some, you know, because of distance and time uh, uh, could be something not very, uh, uh, not, not everybody can do, unless they have lots of time. Though it is fascinating, you touched upon it because there are a lot of people, uh, you know, in the audience who might not know about this unique music festival which takes place in Kohima. So, if you could just share with us, you know, the ideas and concept behind this music festival and what actually happens here. So, I would say this Hornbill Music Festival is one of the longest uh, running music festival, also in terms of the years. It's also, we are also on the 22nd year. And the, the fact that it's a 10 day music festival also makes it very unique and, you know, it's long, but we love our music and, we, you know, we love uh, to celebrate life. And uh, that has also uh, done a lot of good for us. Now the Hornbill Music Festival, I say it's, it's big because it is, it is spread over two, two or three towns. Like one is at Kisama, one is in Kohima, and then one more venue is in Dimapur. And when we count all the cafes and all the other uh, venues, it's like spread across uh, about 15 venues over 10 days. The concert uh, sort of has about uh, 500 musicians that play, in, you know, spread over the, the 10 days. And it employs, it, you know, thousands of young people. It generates a lot of uh, jobs uh, uh, for people in terms of food, event management, uh, besides the performers. And uh, so this is something we all uh, look forward to. It happens every year from uh, 1st to 10th of December. And uh, yeah, it's uh, we, for anyone who has not been to the Hornbill Music Festival, we invite you. So uh, if I may say this again, that we have two sort of running parallel ideas here during Hornbill. One is the, the very traditional uh, that showcases our culture that happens at Kisama. It's about a uh, half an hour drive from the main city, Kohima. And then we have the Hornbill Music Festival, which really showcases the very contemporary sort of the genres of music, uh, dance. In fact, Lam Grace is organizing something called the Hornbill Dance Off uh, this year itself. So from dance to hip hop to DJ, EDM, rock, pop, uh, K-pop. Uh, so it just, so I would say, the Hornbill Festival and the Music Festival has something for everybody. And that makes it very unique and, 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 and large in content and sort of reach. So as they yes, say, there is, there is a background to every great story. So we would like to understand how is it that, you know, this Kohima emerged as a hub of music and dance uh, was it, I mean, you, you have seen it evolve from the 80s onwards. So why, I mean, unlike say in Tripura or Manipur or, or Arunachal Pradesh, why is it that uh, it was in Nagaland, it was Nagaland and Kohima which emerged as this center for music and arts. Was it there in, you know, uh, rooted in the traditional uh, Naga culture, the tribal culture, or was it an attempt a, a conscious attempt by the government and the patron in the 80s and the 90s. So how do you see the background to this cultural renaissance happening there? Yeah, we have, you know, Nagas by nature, we love music. Uh, but I think it was in 2003 uh, when our present chief minister, uh, Nipu Ryo, he, he took over as the chief minister. He, he saw that, you know, that the, the talents of the young people really needs to be encouraged and patronized. And that's when they set up the, the, the music task force. It was MTF, known as MTF Music Task Force then. Of course, 2019, we sort of re-Christianed it to TAFMA, which is Task Force for Music and the Arts. So I would say the, the, the cultural, the arts, music, or renaissance that is taking place is also hugely dependent on the government patronage. Uh, the, the funding, the patronage, the, the, the type of uh, platforms that the government is creating, uh, supporting of the music festivals, not just the Hornbill festivals, but we also we are trying to create festivals throughout the year. Like we have the Nagaland Guitar Festival, 
We have Dimapur Music Festival. We have uh, uh, we have uh, a lot, lots more private festivals that have come up. We have like, like something like Orange Festival. So I think this is all, uh, and then a lot of these festivals uh, are supported by the government, and in, including hip hop, dances, lamgris is is uh, you know uh, one example where we also we are trying to support her activities because uh, she she's great at great at it. She has won international recognition. So you know, and because we have very little sort of the sort of the, the corporate sector of sponsorships, that is still a very difficult thing for our musicians and our industry. So government plays a huge role, uh, sort of, uh, of investing its resources for the development and growth of the arts, the culture, the music. So th this government support is truly responsible for for the exponential expansional growth that we are seeing today. Fascinating, fascinating. Thank so you. I, I, I want to ask you, uh, you know, you, you have seen the evolution of the music. Now, thanks today, thanks to the internet, YouTube, the youth have access to the latest music trends happening around the world, the latest fashion, the latest dance happening around the world. But it, this was not so 20 years ago. So at that time, when you were starting in your career and, you know, your contemporaries were starting in the career, how is it that... I mean, considering how, how remote Kohima is and, you know, the questions of accessibility, how was it that these various cultural strands and influences came to Kohima? How, what were your influences in the uh, early days, pre-internet days? Um, I think my generation, I think one of our biggest influence were the radio. Uh, of course, the TV was just coming in, but uh, uh, in the... Radio was a big part that sort of introduced us to, especially the Western uh, music, uh, Western pop, rock, uh, the Beatles, uh, you name it. So I think that had a great influence on us. Of course, the cassettes started to come in and then the record players. So, but I think we all started, would say, with the radio. And one thing, if I may add, uh, our love for music, especially Christian, uh, uh, the, the Western type of music, really goes back to our sort of to our faith uh, you know that uh, uh, Nagaland is a majority Christian state and also we are very influenced by the American missionaries who brought their hymns the pianos the, their violins so I think you know more it was that's that was more than 150 years ago so so that we sort of date back to that in terms of our uh, western music influence so I guess that has really sort of come down and has a, had a great impact uh, on the way we express ourselves through sort of the Western tunes. And again, uh, because of the so many tribes in Nagaland, we have English as our first language. Uh, so this also contributes to our love for uh, sort of the, 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 the Western type of, the just a, sort of a very natural sort of uh, bend towards loving and also imbi uh, uh, imbibing and, you know, and, and growing with it. So I think those are the little influences that uh, has influenced us and continued to influence us, uh, old and young, both. Oh, fascinating. So I'm going to Thank come you. now to uh, Imcha uh, from Bangalore to Kohima. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what? I mean, since you're such so big in the music scene and you are uh, a young uh, musician there, so what are the influences on, on your music? Influences, uh, I mean, like it's gonna be usually the uh, mostly the Western singers, you know. And then uh, I've been growing up listening to uh, Frank Sinatra, so and Elvis Presley, so they're they are one of my biggest icon and everything. So, yeah. <laughs> so, how, considering uh, you know you moved to uh, Kohima, how how do you see? I mean, obviously, it must be uh, very vibrant and very lucrative, uh, the music industry in Kohima. So, how 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 do you see the, the music industry today? I mean, like, so far with whatever I've seen, you know, you know, like, I really appreciate the artist's effort trying to make those videos look very international right now, like, comparing to those music videos that are uh, in the Pehle Jayamani times, you know, like, to this day right now, it's evolving. And then that's what making us, we now got to stand out, you know, and then at the end of the day, I mean, like, I think comparing to the other states, I think Nagaland is the only one where, you know, mode of communication is English. And then I think that influence of Westernness 
you know, from our ancestors, you know, growing up, listening and everything. So, yeah, I was like, it's evolving right now. So, to what I see now and then, yeah. And I'm going to ask this question to Lam also later, but as a young Naga musician, do you see music as a form of identity or is, is it for, for you, it's just entertainment or is it for Naga youth, is it also a kind of identity and uh, show you know, like collectivity, expression. How how do you see that? I mean, like, you mean as a career option, something like that? Uh, as passion. I mean, how, how do you see that? I mean, do you see this as a very distinct, uh, you know, uh, identity? I mean, as like, a... in Naglin, right? Yes. Mm. See, uh, in Naglin, I'm like, the passion is strong out here. The dream also is very big. But then, you know, like, still... People out here, they don't see music as an occupation. You know, there are some few elderly, you know, they just depend on government jobs or get a doctor or everything, something like that. Nah? So passion is really strong out here, but then the only thing is that's a family support, you know? I'm like, when you don't get a family support, I mean, like, I'm like, the support starts from the family itself only, right? Now, if you're not getting that, how would you expect? So basically, some people, if they really want to take the field of music, you know, they have to educate themselves everything, you know, like with the music business now, because uh, when you start off music, you're going to be independent. You'll have to support everything by yourself and everything. You know? So they really have to educate. If they're not able to really, if they really see this occupation as the best thing, that's the purpose in life, then they really have to educate their parents. I mean, like, it will take time, but it's worth to wait if you really want to achieve this career. Nah? So, yes, with an industry right now. So this is just a little bit I'm explaining from my side. And uh, especially now with so many music festivals happening in Nagaland, do you think it has given more opportunities to uh, local musicians, more visibility yeah. to local musicians? Yeah, locally, yes. So, I mean, like, Nagaland is like a very, very less population out there. Everybody, like, whether you're famous or not famous, but then when you get the criteria of, I'm like, yes, uh, label of famous, everybody knows you, right? So, yes, uh, with everything that's been happening around, with the shows and everything, I think uh, it's blooming. And then uh, people are getting to know, okay, music also, it's a career, something like that now. Fascinating. I'm so like, now at the end of the day, it's going to be, yeah, oh, sorry. No, please, <laughs> please, please. <laughs> no, no, it's all right, it's all right. Okay, so I'm now going to come to Lam. Lam, you know, last time when we were talking, you were uh, telling me about the vibrant street culture and the street dancing taking place in Kohima. So please do share it with our audience as well. Okay, uh, where do I even start? Like, <laughs> it was, uh, you know, uh, way back in 2018, we started the first uh, International Dance Day celebration in Nagaland. So I thought, why not I just take this thing to the street, you know, because uh, when uh, we see hip hop, you know, hip hop, it, it started from there. So this this is the root culture. So I thought, you know, why don't I take this uh, thing to the street? So um, uh, we just start off this uh, first year, first event. Uh, so it went very well, you know, like it was it was so good. So we thought of just continuing this uh, street jam, street dance competitions. And till today, it's going really good. And um, just this year, uh, Piano Festival took place in the street itself. And I think it's because of the Smart City project that is going on in Kohima. Uh, we have this place in, in the street where, you know, we can... Uh, just come and chill out and, you know, cyclists, skateboarders, they just come around, play around, the dancers, they can practice, you know, on the street. So, um, it, it's, I cannot really express, you know, from my, uh, from my mouth, you know, uh, what, uh, how vibrant it is. But uh, what I can say is that uh, lots of young talents, they, they are growing, they are growing and I can see the, them growing so much, especially in this field of arts. So dance, music, uh, art, including the art, the paintings and everything, they are coming together to, you know, make this Kohima into a vibrant, beautiful uh, city. Fascinating. You know, I want to ask you, Lam, uh, 
what is it that draws people to dance i mean the youths to dance to take street take up street dancing because i mean like uh, it just said there is not much it is not finance, there is not much money in it so what is it is it just their expression their self identity what what draws people to street dancing mm, i think uh, like if we look at the roots of most of the hip hop dance uh, or the hip hop culture it's more of you know like expressing ourselves uh we want to express you know through dance and i think there's a there's a one uh, form of uh, form of dance called cramping you know where people instead of you know fighting gang fighting they use this expression of dance you know to express themselves in, instead of gang fight you know so uh we as a dancer i myself as a dancer we started as a passion you know uh as a way of expressing myself but as as uh we start i started dancing even more i just realized that um it can be a career you know so during our times there was no one to tell us you know you can make dancing as a career so uh for me it was like a hobby i took up dance as a hobby only you know but as uh with the advancement of technology and you know internet and everything now we we are learning you know we have realized the importance you know of art that uh, it's not just the government job it's not just the doctor you know engineer that can sustain us but it's the art even the art that can sustain us fascinating fascinating so i would like to uh, come back to teja uh, i wanted to ask you there is this uh, great western influence on the uh, music in nagaland and then there is the traditional uh, naga music uh, of the tribes and you know which has been going on for the centuries so how do you see the interplay between the two i mean in the youth are they still interested in traditional music or are they only interested in english and hip hop uh, how, how are the thing how are things there uh i think if i from what i observe i think there are two uh, there are sort of equal number of people practicing both for example there are many if you go to our 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 villages you know our our folk way or our traditional way of life is still very intact is not disturbed no matter the influence of uh, west uh, western culture or any or you know any any sort of outside is still there i mean the the closer we were would be different our buildings might look very modern but when it comes to our say our individual tribal festivals we really go back to our roots and everything is just practiced as it was practiced you know down the centuries i think that is still very intact uh if you look at some of our choirs of lately a lot of our choirs have also started to not just do western but also they're researching into a lot of our folk culture our 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 tunes are mm-hmm. you know telling telling and and uh, sort of discovering our folk stories folklores and putting them into music so so along with the contemporary which is again in the urban cities where like say dimapur kohima we are rock pop hip hop there's a huge this thing i think there's a good balance of both uh, if you come uh, to to kohima in nagaland i think we, we see a good balance of both especially if you come again during the hornbill festival which takes place first and second week of uh, december you would just see how rich the two are and how well the two are going together there's no sort of a friction or conflict between the very modern and the very traditional i think uh, we are at a beautiful space as far as my observations are concerned concerned yeah so now you know with so many music festivals uh, happening in uh, nagaland do you see that transforming the lives of local musicians uh, i mean since you have seen the evolution through past decades absolutely absolutely i mean like uh, say for example during, in in my hey days as a musician we stuck our own posters we 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 printed our own banners sold our own tickets uh, carried our own speakers to the halls like people like imcha and lam grace i had, I had a very i would say the lucky lot and at a beautiful beautiful space uh, we, we have hundreds of people who do things for them now run around build the stage put up the leds all they do is practice come and dance so i think uh, it has evolved heavily and i think uh, 
they have a lot to be grateful for to people like us who did all all the hard work of keeping the tradition no not jokes aside uh, but i think it has grown and uh uh i think from from the present crop of artists i think we had a good space and uh like intra said yes uh it's not all milk and honey and you know it's all uh all blooming and all rosy uh, we still have a, lo- a lot of challenges hurdles uh, like i said the very fact that we have very little corporate presence in nagaland really call uh, you know creates a lot of uh, hurdles and challenges for event managers and artists and musicians but uh, the way things are moving i think it wouldn't be very long before we see uh, some big <clears throat> big things happening uh, to nagar artists not just in nagaland but for them making an, uh, an impact outside of our borders so that's that is uh, that is the dream with which we are working hard especially to pr- to promote our younger lot so i'm going to now move a bit away from uh, the genre of music and uh, you know sure, connected sure. with with the fo- uh, earlier discussion th- uh, that we had on the traditional music and we have a very interesting question uh, from an audience member that uh, with so many cultural practitioners living and practicing in nagaland we have very little access to the cultural archives of the state do you think such a prominent uh, archive exists in nagaland of the past uh, uh, traditions and practices and cultures and if not how do you preserve such a unique uh, archive how do you preserve the local traditions uh that's a very good question i think now uh, of lately only i think this whole consciousness or the 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 what do you say the responsibility to actually start archiving putting them into writing sort of has just begun unfortunately and i think that this uh, but it's a uh, better late than never as they say so the the process has begun especially with my department and under the direction of the chief minister we are looking uh, at this very closely how to actually start sending uh, uh people into the uh, interiors very soon to start actually recording their voices uh, getting their stories uh, into uh, into sort of an archive or uh, so like a conservatory at at our music center uh, apart from just music i think uh, uh, one thing i would really uh, give credit to uh, some people who are really doing an incredible job of preserving our stories especially our folklore or you know our the stories handed down to us are the journalists the writers of nagaland uh, in the last decade some very prominent names have come up who are uh, actually doing an incredible job of documenting our stories in writing in books uh, they've been released in you know quite a good number now so uh, there's if they uh, if anybody asks of you know or how they could access uh, directly of the you know our naga culture our stories and of the past uh, especially the past one great uh, medium would be through the books that has been released but apart from recording visuals movies it will take some time we are still on to be very honest uh, not there yet the process have just begun now in in cultural general cultural space uh, as you said you see one of the biggest challenges in a place like kohima is the lack of corporate patronage and also True. as um, you know imcha and lam uh, have said about uh, the youth don't have access to jobs and financial stability so how how do you see that balance between uh, you know the youth looking for jobs and financial stability and pursuing their passion in culture especially in a place like uh, kohima uh i tell all my young people that our market is not nagaland our market is our lovely country india with a billion plus population so all our training uh, we are we are heavily engaging Uh, with our, our artists and the younger lot in terms of capacity building music market music business hopefully the, and hopefully we are you know we are, we feel we are doing the right thing by educating their minds uh uh you know and also giving the right skills for them to actually start moving out of nagaland because uh, in the next few decades i'm not going i i don't foresee a huge corporate culture just booming uh, suddenly out of nagaland so we say 
we tell all the young people, your market is our country, not Nagaland. You, so you, you, you get trained here, you move out, you come back to rest, move out again. That's what our, our market is. So to all, to all the Imchas and all the Lamgris uh, watching this, that is my message in the past. And uh, I believe that is the way forward for industry with so much lack of the corporate sector in Nagaland as of now. So I uh, just uh, wanted to ask you now with the climate change, with uh, Kohima, I'm sure, you know, when you were young and now with urban population uh, being so strong, I mean, the pressures of urbanization, I'm sure there is a lot of pressure on the local communities, the local tribes on on their livelihood, on, on their need to protect their culture. So how, how, how are you? you guys tackling it in Nagaland? I mean, the, all the, uh, the, the economic pressures, the pressures of globalization, of urbanization. Uh, I, that's uh, not a very easy question, I guess, uh, sort of uh, to, to answer, uh, just, just like that. But uh, I could mainly speak for my Tafma, because that's, uh, that's really sort of my, where all my energies are, all my expertise are, and whatever I've learned in the last three decades as a musician and in this industry. Uh, so like I said, coming back to people like Lam Grace and Imcha, you know, with so much passion for their art, they're, they're, you know, so we say even the modern, the very Western culture is their culture. That's what I tell them. That, okay, we, we, you know, we have our own very traditional dances and language and food culture, whatever. But people like them who have sort of grown up from the urban space, the influence of K-pop or Western music, Michael Jackson, that also is part of the culture. So to, to young people like them, especially like I said, when you come to our, our department as, a, as somebody who's sort of heading this, uh, we are trying to influence a lot, uh, sort of put a lot of our uh, resources and time on capacity building, creating platforms for them to get all the exposures they need and hopefully at a good time, push them out of the state, uh, especially for economic uh, sort of uh, uh, benefits because we feel the opportunities out there are immense and the sky is the limit out there. Uh, 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 our country, India, Asia, big markets. And, uh, I, and I always tell the young people, if the Koreans can do it, we can do it too. Nothing is stopping us. Okay, so after that uh, heavy question, I'm going to come to a question about a topic that is very close to my heart, and that is food. And <laughs> uh, uh, you see, the Naga food now is becoming extremely popular. We have uh, restaurants in as far as Mumbai uh, with the Naga cuisine. So please tell us, I'm, I'm sure most of our audience is also interested about the, the food scene of uh, Kohima. Imcha, Grace, you want to take this? Yes, I'm going to. I'm going to ask uh, uh, Imcha first. You know, Bangalore to uh, Kohima. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, like, actually, I'm like pork. I think, uh, as far as I know, I think it's the most popular cuisine here. But for me, uh, I I just consume. I just eat chicken. So basically, pork and beef is not on my. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but I know that pork is like a big thing with uh, this. Uh, yeah. That's all I have to say. <laughs> I think Lamb Grace will know better. Uh, yes, I'm going to come to Lamb. Uh, are there a lot of restaurants in in uh, in uh, Kohima and a very thriving food scene? Do you eat out a lot? Um, yeah, actually, if you go to any like restaurants, you will get uh, Naga cuisine in almost all the restaurants. But uh, uh, as Incha mentioned, we Nagas love pork. I mean, say that I'm also not, uh, I'm also more like a veg lover, so I can't be much about that, but um, it's good if you, uh, the taste of, I would say that the most, the thing that I really like about the Naga food is the taste of the king chili. That's, that's, that's my taste, you know, like in any dish without that, <laughs> it's, it's like, Mm, it's like I didn't uh, taste a good food 
you know so uh there are a lot of uh, good cuisines in uh, uh in Netherlands and uh i'm also uh, like i've mentioned i'm also not a uh, very uh, kind of like foodie person but uh i love uh what's that i love i would i love this pork with bamboo shoot that's that's my favorite even if i don't like pork that much i would say that that's my favorite <laughs> I mean, I really love that. So, uh, actually, yeah. can I just add something there, if you don't mind? Yes, please. No, one thing very unique about uh, Nagaland is, you know, the like I said, there are 16 major tribes, 12 districts. And if you travel into all the districts, we have, you know, a totally different food habits, our likes, dislikes. Uh, so I think it's a, you know, interesting uh, place uh, for somebody who, who loves, you know, who's a foodie and wants to, you know, have different tastes, flavors, uh, it's a it's a must visit. So you see, the food is also a very important part of the cultural landscape of a city. Now, if I am a visitor and if I am uh, coming to Nagaland or uh, to Kohima to explore its culture. Where do I go and explore the traditional culture? Is it in Naga homes or you find these spaces where uh, a visitor can come and experience uh, a traditional Naga cuisine? Uh, where does one find, you know, in a, in a city, in a, in a traditional city? Where for, for you guys, it must be like an everyday food and all. But for us, it's a cultural experience. So... Uh, how, how do you see that? I mean, uh, in 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 Kohima, I think the best way to experience the true Naga food is to to stay with a Naga family, and the many homestays, guest houses have come up off lately. Of course, with the with the Hornville also attracting a lot of tourists, and there are also a lot of uh, small villages around Kohima town, half an hour, one hour, very easily accessible, and and of course, I've taken a lot of guests to these villages. Like, so for example, uh, in 2019, just for example, we had the visit of uh, A.R. Rahman to our Hornbill Festival closing ceremony. So we took him about a one hour journey into the village. And we actually had lunch at a paddy field, a Naga organic lunch, uh, with some people singing a folk song. So I think that those type of packages have become very almost uh, very common and v readily accessible. There are a lot of young people are sort of operating these type of activities. So, uh, like, and you said it correctly, because uh, we're eating Naga food in our homes every day. Uh, a lot of other spaces don't have too much, I wouldn't say, except for one or two hotels. We, we enjoy the, the, the more the North Indian and the, the, you know, the tandoors and the, the rotis and the biryanis. We, yeah. we just love them. We, if you go to our weddings, you'll have a lot of Indian items too. Uh, and not Naga items necessarily. So we don't have too many restaurants, uh, to my knowledge. But there are a lot of young people operating tours, packages, walks, experiences that someone can easily book and get to enjoy uh, sort of Naga culture in its, full, in its totality. So any cultural experience becomes viable when it is connected with commercials. And a good example of that is, say, the cities of Rajasthan, like uh, Jaipur and Udaipur, where, say, in 1947, they were one of the most uh, not so developed regions of uh, India. They were kind of backward. And today, thanks to tourism, I mean, in, in places like Rajasthan, even in the remotest villages, you can find Italian restaurants because Tourism has bought in uh, so much of money, has transformed uh, lives of the people. How do you see that uh, in, in Kohima? I mean, how do you see the transformation in the last 22 years with the Hornbill Festival and the Music Festival? How do you see that transformation has taken place in, in Kohima with the advent of the visitors, the uh, political stability? Uh, uh, technological advances, internet. So, so how, how, how do you see this uh, link between tourism, culture, and the transformation of lives? Uh, to be very honest, and uh, I think as compared to other cities of India, with the, you know, Rajasthan and other big festivals, I think we are uh, still 
uh, a long way to go. Uh, Hornbill being that it's just one time, uh, sort of 10 days in a year. And that is, uh, so that's just 10 days in, in a year. Of course, during that time, there's absolutely no more space to, to sort of no, no, no space to sleep, uh, to stay. I mean, just get totally booked out. In fact, people book hotel rooms one year ahead of time if they want to come for Hornbill. Uh, unless you want to enjoy that, you, if you want to tent out and you know, get into the village guest houses. Uh, so I think we still have a long way to go in that in that sense of tourism or festivals having a, a sort of a, a huge impact on the local economy and the people. But I think Hornbill is a good start, and uh, uh, I'm sure with time we will really sort of again grow into the the Rajasthan, like you said, uh, restaurants coming up, uh, that will cater to other foreign tourists, their, their cuisine, their food. Uh, of lately, but I think it's also a very encouraging trend of, of sort of sprouting in the city's cafes. I think that just, uh, you know, it just can't keep up with the number of cafes coming up. And also, uh, some, I don't know, uh, Lam Greece, you can correct me, because uh, I, I'm sure you go out more as a, as a, as a youth. Uh, there are some restaurants that also have come up with, to, with Korean food, a lot of it. Or okay, you can correct me on this. Yes, yes, that's very true. Oh, mm. so there's a lot of love of the for... K-pop culture, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so definitely the K-pop sort of influences big. And I think there are a lot of uh, restaurants that also have some Korean items, especially mm-hmm. cafes. So uh, it will take time, but I think we are in the right track. Uh, and uh, of course, Hornbill gets all the attention, but especially with the government initiative, we also we are trying to spread festivals across all the districts over, over the months because every tribe has their own festival. Like for example, in the month of February, the Kohima will have something called the Sekreni Festival that is primarily celebrated by the Angamis. Uh, I don't know, Moats, uh, when is Moats, uh, uh, Incha? Which month? Any <laughs> idea? <laughs> Lam Grace, any, any cookie festival? Which month? Uh, Mimkut. Oh. January, Which month it's you... during winter. January huh. or February. So, so every month, the tribal festivals take place, which government also is trying its best to promote. So that's not just Hornbill centric, but uh, festival centric throughout the year. So uh, it's just a matter of time. But for now, uh, the, the crown is the hornbill. So, uh, Lam, I want to ask you, in Mumbai, we have a very vibrant uh, hip-hop uh, community and a street dancing community. So is there like interaction with uh, the hip-hop communities of, say, Delhi and rest of India? I mean, do you interact? Do you have competitions, dance-offs? Uh, yeah, there was this uh, hip hop Indian hip hop dance championship. So it's a, a national level um, competition where you know dancers are you know, selected from different districts of India. So the selected participants they come to Mumbai and they compete against one another. So I was also a part of that one. So um, yeah, uh, I think it was Mumbai. I think it was only Mumbai, and I still have a connection with them. Uh, I participate uh, whenever, you know, uh, whenever I can, because of this lockdown, I could not go for two years. You know, but uh, still then, I'm trying to interact them to, you know, online. Um, yeah, and we are planning to, you know, go uh, after this, uh, whenever this offline competition starts again. So this... Uh... The hip hop, which is done in Nagaland, you know, music and uh, street dancing and all. Do you see variations? Do you see what they do in Mumbai or Delhi different from what 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 is happening in in Kohima? Yeah, of course, because uh, is is the culture, you know, that uh, the knowledge that that we lack, you know, we lack the knowledge about hip hop, especially here in uh, Nagaland. Um, so there's there's a variation. There's a lot of difference, and we have started. It's it's still blooming. <laughs> it's still blooming. So, you know, um, I can say that uh, in few years it can be better. But for now, 
I can see a lot of variations. Yeah. So th- that is a very interesting point that unlike say a Mumbai or a Delhi, uh, the knowledge of hip hop, the international influences may not be that strong. So how, how do you improvise? I mean, how, how do you get over this knowledge gap? Uh, first, uh, uh, first thing is, you know, explore, you know, exploring. It's not just about, you know, sitting in our place and, you know, um, trying to get knowledge from the internet. Of course, that's, that's a good thing, you know, trying to learn things from YouTube. And I've learned a lot, but going out there and exploring the place and exploring those competitions, meeting them, you know, it's, it's a different uh, experience. And I think I should say the experience that I have or the knowledge that I gained from YouTube, uh, it's, it's compared less, you know, to the experience that I had through exposure, you know. So I think like explore, exploration is, you know, like the main thing. Yeah. Interesting. No, I, I'm, I'm going to ask Imcha also this question, but I'm, I'm going to start with you that uh, uh, for anybody, you know, who wants to do cultural practice and all of I it, mean, we, we in Mumbai, Pune, Delhi have this problem where there, there, there are not enough spaces for people who want to do cultural practices or performances because of obviously the real estate pressures and uh, a lot of other things. So if you have to practice, you want to hang out with friends, you want to improvise and all, where would you generally go in, in a place like Kohima? Do you have community halls? You have cultural spaces where you can just go and practice. How does that work? Practice like in a session, like uh, like we're just hanging out, chilling out with friends, something like that, you mean? Yes. Yes. Ah. Uh, jamming, uh, improvising. Oh, ja- okay, okay. I mean, uh, so for, for jamming, uh, I haven't experienced it. But now if you plan to come to Kohima and then you just want to chill with your friends, I mean, like there's some few cafes out here. I mean, like, that's what you're trying to say, right? That this is the answer you want, right? Mm-hmm. So basically, um, yeah, there's even though it's a dry state, I mean, like, there's still the bar and restaurants out here, but then the prices are pretty steep, you know. So you just have to make sure that your pockets are, you know, heavy. Otherwise, it's not like in the cities area how you get <laughs> for a can of beer, you know, like for like hundred bucks. Out here is like if you go to a bar, it's like two fifty, three hundred, something like that. No, so yeah, but still you can uh, you get to enjoy the vibe, and then along with that, there are some few cafes with the whole view of Kohima. You know, so basically there's a balcony out there. You can just chill with your friends and then implore the views and everything. So basically you're getting getting the whole experience with the cold weather and then with the people around. No? So yes. You should uh, come down for horn, but then you get to experience everything. <laughs> but but for, for somebody who's starting his music career in Kohima, how, how does he start? Yeah. Would he start playing at a local, local, um, would he start in a local choir? Would he start in a local bar performing? Because that's how what happens in the West. Because in a place like London, you would start in a local club pub, then get a few gigs, then you get a, uh, you know, play at a venue. So how, how is that journey? So when it comes to musician, I mean, like, um, there's there's clubs that initiates, you know, there's this weekend, the festivals and everything. So this is where, right now, I just want to mention this all, but uh, Sir Deja is my boss and then I'm working for him. So basically with all these changes right now, it's only through his power that he came into his power and then everything is like changing right now. So basically earlier times, it was kind of difficult for the artists to, you know, get a show or anything could be happening. But then right now, whatever sh- uh, events that we initiate, it's all powered from Tafma. So basically, with this power nation, and like this, is all uh, everything has been happening around, and uh, the artists also the shows and all. I mean, like, like, I, like we told you, like the population is very small, so everybody knows who is who. So basically, they know who to reach out for the next show to happen. And so basically, now if the artist is really interested, so this is where they get the connection. So with all this, uh, they just initiate a show, and based on ticket systems or sometimes you know through donation or something like that, nah. So it has us all do's and do. I mean, like uh, advantage and disadvantages, but these are the things that what I see with the opportunities happening around. Yes, sir. So actually, if I may add, because you were saying about the space, uh, where do one begin? Uh, especially if they are trying to pursue music as a passion, as a career. I think one of the, one of the first step for any musician or a young musician is the church. I think the church, being a part of the church choir or being part of the church band. And I started 
uh, you know, very early on as a teenager with my church band, then moved on to other, other, other bigger things. So I think one surest way and, you know, many people, you know, big, start the culture in Nagaland, start their sort of this passion, this journey, uh, many were credited to the church. So that way the church mm-hmm. has given a lot of platforms, uh, like weekly meetings, weekly Sundays, uh, you know, every, every Sunday there's some music going on. Uh, so every Wednesday there's a practice for Sunday. So I think it really, really sort of brings people together. So church does play a huge role uh, in the yes. life of a musician yeah. in Nagaland. So I, I would uh, like to ask our audience members if you have uh, questions for the panel, you do share it with us and we'll, we'll take it up with them. We do have a, a question for Imcha. Uh, it, this is from Minakshi Shede. Uh, she asks, in addition to your music talents, do you find that it is important to market your music with, uh, not only market to uh, your music videos, but also explore the local, modern and traditional fashion? I mean, for example, you have done a cinematography of music videos for the Tesso sisters. So that has that happened uh, organically? So, uh, the, uh, like the importance, numbers. yes. So the importance of marketing your music. How do you see that? Mm. So basically, you're talking about the numbers that the that the music that videos. Yes. Gather. So how 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 it, so how like do you think it is very important to market not only create music but also market it? Yes. I mean, like you can create, but then at the end of the day, through promotion only we can get some attraction, right? I'm like, but then he, out here in Ireland, uh, like the views out here like support is good when it comes to online all right so um but at the end of the day marketing also plays a vital role at uh, but you got to understand how to market it really well that's where music business applies so out here the musicians out here they have to you know educate themselves with what's happening around in the music now if you really want to promote something you got to understand the marketing strategy of the music business that way they can you know Elevate. I mean, like when the releases is happening, they can gather a lot of attention. No, at the end of the day, numbers plays a vital role in the digital streaming. I'm mean, like these days is all digital, right? No, so numbers, so it it plays a vital role, right? So now if you understand the music business, like a background, I mean, like they can just easily initiate a market strategy. But uh, I want to ask you, like for example, you have done something with Tetsu Sisters. So how? I mean, being in Kohima, how would you do international collaborations? How how does that happen? I mean, I'm actually an independent artist. I cannot explain, but from my point of view, I can I just explain. So right now I'm working, uh, I mean, like I'm signed a record label in Bombay. So basically uh, our office is one in Bombay and then the other one is in the States. So since I'm working with them as an artist, which via them, I'm getting the connection. So out here, they're still networking, but at the end of the day, um, the artist has to get this networking. You know, as long as he's hanging out with the right people, that way to get the international collaboration, you know. But for me, mine, so it's only from the label that I'm getting the connection. So I think it also is like networking everything, right? Okay, great. So I'm, I'm going to now, uh, you know, take concluding remarks from uh, three of you. And uh, I'm sure our audience will be interested and I'm super interested is that every city has that a uh, hidden place where, you know, which is very culturally vibrant and, you know, the great things in art culture are happening and you want to come, you know, when you visit that city, you want to hang out there. So Teja, I want to start by asking you, what is your favorite hangout place? What is that hidden place in <laughs> Kohima that uh, uh, you would want us, we must go on our trip to Kohima to experience the feel and culture of Kohima city? Yeah, since I sort of, uh, uh, I'm sort of very engaged with the art and music community and also for the promotion. Uh, the one space that you must visit will be the regional center uh, for performance and uh, a regional center of excellence for music and performing arts, short form RSEMPA. That's where my office also is located. That's where we have a hall. And uh, we have a, a gallery, an art space, a studio. So that's really where the center of all, all things are as far as our music and arts sort of uh, uh, ecosystem and sort of giving direction uh, to our youth is concerned. So I would say, please, when you come to Kohima, drop by to our Simpa, 
I look forward to meeting you and showing you around. So, Lam, you are a you are a street performer. So, I want the name of the street, uh, not the, not an institution, but the street where where we can see experience the most um, vibrant uh, performances in in Kohima. Okay, so it would start from Razo Point. It's uh, Razo Point. It's like the main, you know, town. It's the main town, you know, from Razo Point till. Uh, uh, MLA Junction. It's called MLA Junction. Yeah, uh, it's a recent project. You know, it's a very new project, so it's still you know processing. But uh, so far, it's uh, it's it's a very you know I I I don't know how to express. You know, it's vibrant. It's, it will be more vibrant in days to come. But uh, it's a place where you know. Uh, we even there's a, even if we don't have a studio to practice, we just go there, you know, play in you know, our songs in the speaker, and we just jam together. And uh, Imcha, I'm not going to ask you about Kohima. I want to know a place <laughs> around Kohima, you know, where where you jam with your friends, and you know, you would recommend that uh, all of us hang out there. <clears throat> I think it's going to be Arsiamba. So uh, we have just inaugurated a new uh, jam room. It's called Musify. So I think I've been spending most of my time there because I have a lot of projects in my hand right now. So I think that's the best place. And for the audience, it's open, right, sir? <laughs> <laughs> we are always open. Yes. Fabulous, fabulous. Always open. <laughs> so now, you know, after that very interesting session on Kohima, I'm going to hand it back uh, to Asad. Thank you guys for, um, you know, such an interesting conversation. You know, I, I, this happens after every series, Akshay and me say, okay, now we've got to go to the place and experience <laughs> everything that we've learned in this session. And uh, Kohima is definitely on on my bucket list uh, from Arsimpa to, to raise a point um, and, and the food. But that that's that's uh, on top priority, you know. But honestly, thank you so much uh, for presenting um, uh, your city in such uh, detail and and uh, uh, and creating such interest for us, uh, Akshay. You know, for moderating the session so skillfully, and to the Live History India team for partnering with us. Uh, you know, on a regular basis. As we said, this is the sixth edition. We've already planned three more after this. Uh, so the next one in the series is going to be indoor, which is going to be next month. So we do this as a monthly program. Uh, we have many more interesting programs that Avid pl uh, uh, planned. Our next session is next Thursday, which is the legacy of the Thespian past, where we are going to examine and look at the theater uh, at the Royal Opera House um, and followed by another series called Across Cultures. Um, but uh, to find out more, you know, just uh, check out our website or, or stalk us on social media, as I always say. Uh, but uh, until then, stay safe, stay healthy. Um, and remember that learning never stops. Thank you once again. And thank you, Teja, for, for thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you so thank much, you so much for having us.